Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, as you can probably see from my name, I'm a Russian-speaking person. Uh, but I've been specifically instructed to do these uh, presentations in English. Uh, I will be able to take Russian questions in Russian, no problem. Uh, but I mean, if whatever I say is not completely understood, I'm happy to try and explain later on or in parallel in Russian if you know, things escape. Okay? Right, okay, so the plan for today is to cover several topics on the basics of description objects, which actually are foundations of the semantic web. And then we're going to have some practice in the last session. Uh, I should confess that it's been a very, very long time since I last taught uh, in this format, one and a half hours. So in Britain, lectures are one hour straight. Therefore, I don't know. I might have too much material, I might have too little material. And I hope you will excuse me for this. And then again, before uh, you know, going to the real thing, I want to thank various people who contributed results and materials. Some of them explicitly allowed me to use their material in this talk. Uh, can you read this? I think the screen is a little bit too Okay. Um, I'll ask uh, Dimitri to distribute the files to everyone, so you can't see. Actually, I mean, if you want, I have them on this uh, flash drive. So those of you who have a laptop and cannot see, there's a SWS folder on this. So if you want, copy it to your uh, sorry, it's a simple PDF file. Yeah, I think it's just easy. I think it might be a little difficult to read. I, I was expecting a larger screen. Right, okay, so lots of people contributed knowingly or unknowingly their results and materials to these presentations. Okay, how many of you attended yesterday's lecture on semantic web visions lecture? Oh. Oh, clear. Some people, right. Okay. So I assume that everyone will do that, and therefore I assume that you already know what semantic web is. Okay? But in case you don't, or in case you forgot to organize, I, I, I am a lazy person. I decided, okay, rather than you know, inventing it, I just went onto the Wikipedia and grabbed some sentences which I think highlighted what uh, semantic web is. So they say that, okay, well, the idea is to encourage in the inclusion of semantic content in web pages. Okay? So, good. Machines will be able to read it. The idea is to help computers to perform automated information analysis. Okay, for the same reason. And finally, a web of data that can be processed directly and indirectly by the machines. So this is a citation from, I think, Tim Berners-Lee, who invented this notion of semantic work. Okay, so what does it suggest? It suggests that we should be able to teach machines to understand what we know. Okay? And then if you look at this, key, uh, this drawing form, you've seen this one or a similar one, then you'll see that, okay, well, that's the vision. The vision is that based on what we have now, links and XML, we'll have a pyramid of uh, different languages and uh, structures such that in the end we have we trust in our semantic network. Okay, so the idea is that you can ask a computer to perform some intelligent task and it will perform it in a fully automated way. Okay, so let's have a look at the language specific details of, of what we see at every level. So the low level is Unicode and URI. Well, that's where we are. That's, what we are. that's where we are now. The next stage as envisaged by, well, again, Tim Berners-Lee was uh, a, a, another one, a schema, okay? Then we have RDF plus RDFS. Okay, so all of them are technologies underpinning the semantic web. And I'm not going to talk about them too. Okay? So if you're interested in what happens below this level, please go to track one. That's exactly what they're doing there. Okay, if you're interested in trust and proof, well, it's probably for philosophers and people who do uh, really sort of 
visionary stuff. Okay, so what is trust? How do I know if I do trust or if I don't trust uh, a technology? So essentially what we are doing here is contained in these two boxes and a little bit of this. Okay? So if you want to look into ontologies and vocabularies, definitions, links between terms, we want to look at the logical foundations which underpin the ontology languages and we want to look at analysis of knowledge and proofs. Okay. So, why do we need to pay any special attention to this topic? Well, the goal, of course, is to teach uh, a computer to understand what is going on. And if you want to teach, we have to specify in a direct and explicit way. Okay, think about programming. Okay? Uh, well, if you tell a computer, well, do something, well, I'm not quite sure, but it, it has to be a little bit like that. Well, the computer typically doesn't understand what you want. Okay? So if you want to program, you have to write your program in a... You have to come up with an algorithm first, and you have to code in a programming language. Then the computer can interpret what you want. In the same way, you have got to specify our knowledge in the form that computers can process, understand, and read. And for that, well, we use ontologies, and typically ontologies define terms and the relationships between those terms. Okay, so uh, the term ontology comes from philosophy, let's forget about it, let's look, have a look at how we, computer scientists, understand this term. And again, this is a very famous citation, people repeat it, an explicit specification of a conceptualization. When I first looked at that, I couldn't understand the thing, but then, with the help of colleagues and some explanations, uh, what comes, what becomes apparent is that, well, conceptualization is when, okay, you think about some area, whatever your favorite area is. It can be education, or it can be, I don't know, species of fish, doesn't matter, okay? And then you start and then to understand how this area is arranged. And you come up with some idea, abstract idea of what is there. So say in education, you have universities, you have people who teach, you have courses, you have various relationships between those terms. If you talk about the biology of fish, well, then there are some large fish and small fish. I know nothing about the area, but I'm sure they have uh, appropriate knowledge. Okay? And once you have this conceptualization of your favorite topic, then you can come up with an explicit specification. And when I say an explicit specification, I mean, I say, yeah, well, I already started doing that. I already started saying there is a university, there is a professor, there is a lecturer, there is a course, there is a relation teach, and all of that becomes a part of your specification. Right, so typically, an ontology defines the following things. It defines a common vocabulary, okay? So we're going to be able to talk about, well, Notions. And in this example, I have a notion of an elephant, of a herbivore, of an adult elephant. And on top of that, I mean, okay, well, this is already very important. And for many applications, actually, this suffices. Okay? So I think actually it's good to say now a word of caution. Don't use an ontology if you don't need to. Okay? It might sound a little bit bizarre, but still, sometimes people just want to exchange information. Right? And if they want to do just that, then probably other approaches would be more appropriate. So, okay, well, a little vocabulary, maybe a little data, well, something simpler. And in fact, if something simpler fits the purpose, you don't need more advanced stuff. Because then you can easily barge into the territory where you lose understanding of what is going on. And I think a typical example of when things go wrong is when you look at ontologies and a lot of meaning is not in the relationships between terms, but in the annotations people ask to classes. Okay, so if that happens, then it's only human who can read, because annotations are free text commands. If you just say, okay, you say elephant, and then you add a command saying, well, actually, I came in an Indian large elephant with three legs, and one leg was lost in a tragic accident. Okay, so if you specify that as a commentary, 
no computer program will ever be able to understand. Okay? So what, what, what we are interested in is relationships between those concepts to provide shared understanding. Just to give us an example, okay, well we can say that an adult an elephant weighs two tons. Okay, so this is something we want to accept throughout our level of friends. And then if I say adult elephant, you know exactly what I mean. That it's some animal which weighs at least two tons. Or I can say that elephants can be African or Indian. Oh, right. Okay, well, let's have a look at some examples. Well, the first ever example of meaningful ontologies was coming from library scientists and foundations of uh, biology and stuff. So, for example, Linus came up with, well, something like that. Mammals, uh, so plus, subplus, infraplus, whatever, and goes to species. Okay, so this is biological classification, and this is very useful. Because whenever they discover a new species, they look at it, they see where it fits the classification, and then they say, oh, this is a marine mammal which we've never seen before. Okay? So this classification essentially gives some shared understanding of terms. So we all know what mammals are. Well, they're first animals, then they are, what's the term, the ones they have core pores. Okay, and then etc. 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 Okay, and there are other examples of simple ontologies where essentially we have a hierarchy of terms like um, directory services, typically they have a hierarchical structure. One can even think about the uh, domain name structure used in the internet to uh, associate the name domain names with uh, IP addresses as a kind of hierarchical representation. So if you know that a web address ends with dot .ru, then you know it's a Russian web address. Okay, so it's a very simple form of ontology, but it's useful. And then some people who typically come from the philosophy of science, uh, they invent something known as a top-level ontology, or uh, at least one particular example of that. Well, what people want is to give definition to pretty much everything they come across. And of course, you start with very high-level notions like time, space, process, and typically you can't define these things. But once you sort of uh, start with some notions which you can see the basic, you can uh, try to describe, say, the notion of a process as something that exists in time and space. Stuff like that. Okay, so this gets more complicated. Well, in uh, biomedical sciences, a lot of people use ontologists nowadays, and chemistry as well, so say geneticists, they like a lot their uh, favorite gene ontology, Bell, uh, which specifies the relationship between various genes. Interestingly, they say that the real content of that ontology is in the annotation, because the, the, you know, the ontology from a logical point of view is pretty much trivial. It looks exactly as linear, linear uh, hierarchy, but then in the annotations you find this information. So gene ontology is very useful for uh, geneticists, but probably not very useful for uh, web science research. Uh, okay, so some examples. So then why do you want to come to a school and then, you know, spend time studying any stuff? So just start a program called Protégé, probably you've heard about it, and then just, you know, okay, do it. End of story. Right. So why are you here? And that was a lengthy sort of introduction to try to motivate uh, the rest of today. Right, okay, so if it's a no problem in that, then probably, you know, who would I be to stop doing this? But then, well, what, all, what does it all mean? So if I now start putting things into a system and I say that I have a class and a subclass and certain relations between those classes, well, really, what does it mean? It's good to have an understanding of what you're doing. Okay, then if you start Protégé version 4, at least, maybe it was already in the previous versions, remember, then you'll find a menu called Reasoner. You might get curious what it is, you're going to click on it, 
and it tells you, okay, stack one of those, you do it, and then it says start the reader there. So what happens if you do that? Okay. And then if, if you start the reason, it can say that, oh, everything is nothing. What does it mean? What is going on? Or it can highlight some classes as red and say they're empty. What does it mean? And finally, sometimes you just press a button and nothing happens. And you wait and you wait and you wait and you have no idea what is going on with the system. Okay, so essentially that is the point of what we are going to do today. We're going to look at the following topics. So first I'm going to talk a bit more formally, and actually I'm sort of, I'm doing it in a, if you remember, didactic way, inspire us, right? So first I'm going to give a very informal introduction, but I'll try to be a little bit formal, into a wide range of ontology languages, you know, um, going up to destroy if you have the, the term and introduce a logic-based semantics of those languages and then I'm going to come back to easier and sort of more understandable languages NC and AL and talk specifically about again the semantics and about reasoning problems uh, that we deal with those languages and of course then I make a leap from the fact that once you understand what goes on with the simple logic, you can extend it to more expressive ontology languages. But if I immediately start talking about them, too many details, okay? Too many details can distract from understanding the real thing. And in doing that, I'm also going to highlight the balance between expressivity and uh, running time, essentially. Okay? So it addresses the point of why it's so slow. And towards the end of today, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the knowledge of logic can help you with ontology engineering. So, it's not that you just understand what is going on, but probably you can learn one or two useful tools motivated by the logical approach, and you'll be able to use them in your, uh, well, whatever experience you have. And finally, we have this hands-on uh, towards the end of today. By the way, having mentioned the hands-on, uh, hands-on, um, it's not really an exam, yeah? So what I want you to do, I want you to work in pairs. And basically, I'll give you a task, and I would want you to talk between each other, and maybe, you know, discuss ideas, and I don't want to interrupt, uh, so I'll give it like 15 minutes. And then probably we'll just change ideas and see what solution everyone, every player comes up with. So, I mean, Dimitri said that you'll need a laptop. Okay, uh, so if there is one laptop per two people, that's already fine. Okay, <laughs> that's the idea. Right. Okay, well, I mean, we're going to have a longer lunch break. Excuse me. Yeah. What? Okay, so the idea is that I want people to work for the hands on in twos. Uh, sure. I to be Каждый получит пару заданий. Ну, вообще задание будет всем. Потому что иначе как? Ну, иначе вы всем не будете сдавать, на это буду смотреть. Я предлагаю так, что люди разобьются на пары, а обсуждать будут между собой в течение какого-то времени. А потом мы просто посмотрим то, что придумал. Спасибо. И поэтому достаточно одного лаптопа, я не знал, что не будет компьютеров. Будет достаточно одного лаптопа на два человека. Поэтому, если, скажем, у вас есть пара с двумя лаптопами, может быть, вам имеет смысл по-другому развить. Should I go on? Okay. Right. Okay, so ontology languages. So what properties do we require from ontology languages? Okay, so whenever you talk about a language, you have to be able to specify the syntax of this language. So if you know, well, I've been too long in England and therefore it really irritates me now that people insist that you put commas where you should put commas. But I mean, that's what we learned at school. Okay, so there are strict rules in Russian on where a comma should be or shouldn't be. Anyway, whenever you talk about studying any language, you've got to concentrate on strict rules which define the syntax of this language. So which expression is a correct expression and which expression is not. So if I say something like Boris window is not, then it's not a correct expression in English. Okay? 
Uh, then, once we have a syntax, we'll talk about the semantics. And the need to specify the semantics is explained by the fact that it's going to be read by a machine. Okay? So, well, pretty much as a human, I can understand the sentence, for this window is not. And actually, the, you know, you can teach the machine to get it. But until, sort of, you really teach a machine to understand the meaning of the sentence, then, uh, well, what's the point of doing this? And I remind you that the point of us introducing ontologies is to enable information exchange. So if machines cannot understand the language, we are not enabling anything. We are just annotating our data with something that machines can't understand and probably we can't understand either. Because as it grows, and if you don't have any methodology of sort of understanding what is going on, what's the problem? Okay, then once we have this, it's already a lot. But some people want to go further. Some people want to say, okay, I have specified my knowledge in an ontology. I now have a strict semantics. So in principle, machines can read it. In principle, machines can derive new knowledge based on old knowledge. But, you know, what does it mean in principle? Well, when we talk to mathematicians, they are happy with the fact that in principle means you press a button, go away, and sometime in the future, say in a hundred year time, you come back and see an answer. Well, for computer science, this is not good. For computer science, we want efficiency. You want to be able to press the button and get the answer in reasonable time. What reasonable time is, I don't know. Well, define this. And finally, well, one can come up with a very strict, well-defined, efficient language, but you can't express what you want. Okay? So then, of course, we must have, this is least specified, but we must have enough expressive power to be able to model the phenomena we are interested in. Okay, so a little bit of history. Uh, probably you've seen this if you had any uh, tuition on uh, knowledge representation. It's starting from 1966, 68, 70. Uh, semantic networks. So essentially, uh, well, the mathematicians sort of stole the idea, but it was coming from psychology, mind maps. Basically, you want to think about something, you want to explain things. It's a difficult area. What you do, you start drawing. So you put a circle and say, well, oh, this is a bird. Okay? And then, what a bird is? A bird is an animal. So let's draw another circle and put animal there and draw an arrow. Okay? And when it was invented, there was no intention of uh, using it for formal knowledge representation. But really to express ideas that one human can draw a mind map, show it to another human, this guy looks at this, oh yeah, I get it. Okay, but then uh, computer scientists hijacked the idea, and then, well, it started with Quillian and then Minsky, and they sort of made it sort of formal uh, structure, where you say, essentially you represent what you know about, say, salmon, uh, which is fish, so you say that salmon is a fish, and the fish is an animal, and that's it. And here you have ostrich, which is a bird, and the bird is an animal. And then uh, if you really go into the frame um, kind of uh, paradigm, then you add some attributes, like uh, salmon lays eggs, uh, swims upstream, is pink, and is edible, or stuff like that, right? So what about the strict syntax? Not so much of that, yeah? Just draw a circle, put some name in it, draw an arrow. But once you start editing them in a computer program, then essentially, typically, you can come up with, say, XML representation of this uh, picture, and then you can specify the strict symbols. What about semantics? Well, again, initially there was no semantics, then people were working on uh, giving semantics to these pictures, and actually, description logics, once I'm going to talk about today, come from this idea. So what now we really want to do, once we have that picture like that in our mind, just specify what it really means. Okay, so a different extreme. Do people know what first order logic is? Anyone? Okay, 
there is at least one person in the, in the room who knows what first order logic is. Well, essentially, okay, let me ask you a different question. How many of you have had a subject called higher maths in the university? We should be smart. Lots, okay? So, yeah, you'll probably remember this weird symbol, which means for all. So then what this sentence says is for all x, y, dot x, and post mod y, implies y is x, y. Okay, so logicians, uh, somewhere in the beginning of the 20th century, formalized what these sentences mean. They gave, gave a strict semantics to first order logic. And in principle, again, I'm just saying, well, guys, that's it. Open a good book by Pliny, say, or someone else. Read about first order logic. It's good. Mathematicians like it. Off you go. However, there are problems. Uh, several of them. First, well, you really need to be, well, you need to have at least some form of mathematical training to understand what these things mean. And also, first order logic is not really structured. So you can write sentences that logicians will spend a lot of time trying to understand. Uh, well, not to talk about end users. Then, okay, well, coming back to the question of efficiency, first of the logic is undecidable. What it means in practical terms? It means that you can write your ontology, you pass this ontology to a computer program, and the computer program will never be able to derive any conclusions from that, which you may not have. And even if you stay in uh, the decidable fragments, some properties such as, say, transfer closure cannot be expressed in uh, first order logic. Okay, so, where we are? We tried too little, we tried too much, and the answer, of course, is in the middle. And this is where specialized ontology languages uh, start playing a special role. And the first one was coming essentially from knowledge engineers. This was coming from the attempt to formalize the semantics of semantic networks, and the resource definition framework, uh, or sorry, resource description framework, or resource description framework with uh, schema vocabulary was introduced in uh, late 90s and has been recommended by uh, W3C, which is World Wide Web uh, Consortium. But this language is rather weak, okay? So you can't um, kind of have precise semantics for uh, interesting expressions, and if you can, then it's not standard, logicians don't like it. And essentially, the programs which deal with them typically used to be what they call structural reasoning. So essentially, if you look again at this picture, uh, the reasoner, what it would do, say, oh, what do I know about some? I see that there is a link, is there, from salmon to fish. So I can conclude that salmon is fish. What can I derive about fish? I can follow this thing and derive that some fish is animal. Therefore, essentially, we look at the picture as a structure and we just use a traversal algorithm to go from one node to another node to another node. Okay? And well, of course, people want more. Therefore, in about 2004, 2009, a different ontology description language, OWL, which stands for Web Ontology Language, you notice that you know, they swapped the input of letters to make it sound better. Uh, this language has been recommended, and then there are various extensions and add-ons on, on, on the ontology language. Okay, just a glimpse of what you can do in classical RDM. You can specify triples. Objects attribute value, and typically this would be a say uh, object would be an author, the relation can be then uh, written by, and then um, this specific value is uh, well, so you can get it. Uh, so let's better look at uh, books, say Robinson Crusoe written by Daniel Defoe. Okay, you can specify those triples and then uh, typically you use uh, this one for free. Okay, so now what I know much better and what I'm going to talk about today is description logics. 
as already said, it's a more advanced family of languages which can specify an ontology. And the idea is that it has to have precise syntax, it has to be given, it has to have a given semantics, and we are interested in automated support of new of reasoning, meaning that you can derive new facts from the known. Okay, so that's Typically, when people uh, talk about description logics, they say, okay, we have to specify the, uh, the entities we are talking about, and the choice of those entities has been inspired by graphical representation. So remember, in the graphical representation, what I had, I had a circle with a name on it. And the circle with the name was any. So what is the name? Well, it's a collection of some beings, right? Look around and, well, you can say that, well, this is an animal, there are lots of animals around. On the other hand, this is definitely not. Okay? So we have a class, a collection. Then we often have relationships between those uh, classes. And again, if you look at, uh, at the graphical representation, you have a class of animals, you have a class of fish, and then you know that every fish is an animal. Therefore, we must have them as well. And finally, often it's good to talk about individuals. So you can say that Boris is not fish, <laughs> unless you can prove otherwise. Uh, so that's the choice of entities uh, which description logics typically deal with. As I already said, they have a formal semantics. And when I talk about the formal semantics, the semantics is essentially the same as in first order languages. So it's more of the model theoretic semantics, typically. And then, again, well, efficient inference uh, systems. So if Dmitry uh, Tsakov makes here, he's here around. OK, so then he'll tell you much more than I can ever tell uh, about uh, efficient inference services. OK, just to break from new concepts, a little history, if you're curious. Uh, started from mid-70s, and the story keeps on until now. It all started with, as I said, these graphical representations, rather informal. But then, uh, in about the beginning of 90s, actually it's the contribution of Franz Bader, a German professor, and he is often forgotten for doing this. So he came up with uh, a calculus for description logic. Uh, but this calculus was terrible, it was very, very slow. Okay, so they had an implementation, and then if you compare uh, the implementation of Tableau with the structural algorithms, it was like at least 10 times slower. Okay? And therefore, practitioners were saying, yeah, well, yeah, of course, your program is better. Because it's, you know, you are mathematicians, you know what you are doing, you have the semantics, you have everything, but wait a minute. I press a button, I get an answer, I give it to you, and it takes you ages to come up with an answer. So mine probably has some value. And that was the accepted view until pretty much in the mid-90s, uh, several people, most notably Ian Horrocks, implemented a much, much faster uh, tabular reasoner, uh, the ART system, which was essentially performing at the same speed as those structural algorithms, and then that was the last drop. Okay? So because you can, you can argue that you don't need all this fancy mathematics as long as your program is faster. But once you have a fast program and it has a very solid mathematical foundation, you lose your ground. And interestingly also, as part of this research, they have identified problems which are really, really difficult for any system, gave them to the structural algorithms, and it turned out that the structural algorithms typically provide an incorrect answer, or the answer. Right. Okay, so where we are now? As I already said, uh, Dmitry Tsarko will be able to tell you much more about Fast Plus Plus and why is it so fast. But we have other systems as well. We have Razor Pro, we have Pellet, we have Hermit, 
which is a part of uh, protege distribution. We now have this new system called ELK, which is uh, really, really fast, but it doesn't mean everything. <laughs> Uh, we have new services which people haven't thought about. We talk about peer answering, we talk about explanations, we talk about versioning. Uh, now we've introduced these new tractable logics, and essentially L is a language, it is a system which reads this uh, tractable uh, fragment of description logics. And we have now something which we call mainstream applications. So it's not anymore on the fringe of science, where people essentially say, oh, yeah, well, let's do a little bit of ontologies, but you know, that's what we are doing in our uh, academic model. No, this is now mainstream, right? So this is a web standard. People do create ontologies, people do publish them online, people do press this horrible reason button and get classifications. People use them for accessing databases, and this is really coming now, so we have, say, scheme integration based on ontologies. So what does it mean, scheme integration? Say you have, well, two companies merge, they want to merge their databases, and one of them, they talk about, I don't know, employees with their name, and another company, they talk about employees with their name and ID number. Now they want to put them in one database, how do they do that? So, lots of questions, how do kind of combine data coming from various sources in one new unified database. And this example is probably more or less easier. Of course, you have to come up with a new and unique ID for those people who don't have it. But in case if you want to rewrite notions or when you want to combine notions in one, then you really have to integrate information. And ontologies can be seen as one possible way of integrating data coming from different sources. And of course, we have Right, okay, so. Can I have the bus for the proofs of this? There's uh, something. Sorry, I didn't uh, get my last. Uh, I'm making an intentional pause. <laughs> right, okay, so. Let's move on and look at. Those things again. As I said, you know, the first session is going to develop in this part. So I'm going to reintroduce notions again and again. And the idea is that, you know, maybe you miss it right away or you don't see something. Or maybe it's just me. Maybe I think again yeah, that, you know, these notions can be difficult. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. But anyway. So again, what is a concept? A concept is a sort of, I, I like this definition I found again, I think, on the Wikipedia. That it's an abstract idea or a mental symbol. Okay? So, in some cases, it's easier to come with concepts. So, something like, like say, the university. Well, it's a clearly defined concept. It's a place where people get education. Okay? But maybe some concepts are not so easy to define. What is time? Well, we have this idea of time in our head but we can't define it properly. Therefore, we can talk about them as units of knowledge. And when it comes to modeling, then typically that's what we call a class in our protege or the ontology of weapon language. So here I have some examples of points of time, I already mentioned space, very difficult to define. But then I have another one which is more or less clearly defined, pneumonia. Okay, it's a disease caused by bacterial infection of some very specific, specific kind. Okay, a human. Again, we can try and define what makes a human. But then again, you know, I we really, are we not? Depends on what we understand. I mean, biologically, human is an animal, which is a primate, which has some brain capacity, but if you talk to some, uh, I don't know, writer, then a writer can say, well, that doesn't make you human. You can walk and eat, but maybe you are not really what we call human. So, you know, things are not so easy to define, but anyway, we have this idea of a collection of individuals, typically, that we join together in a class and we call 
than uh, the concept. And there are relationships between concepts are known as roles in description logic. So this comes from the uh, structural representation, which was popular, you know, by those semantic networks. And uh, let's have a look at some examples. Has child. Okay, so this is a relation between animals caused by, well, this can be a relation between diseases and microorganisms that cause those diseases. Or maybe between diseases and um, events, like, say, an accident. And finally, we have individuals. And an example of that individual, again, is this. So when people talk about the architecture of the logic, then sometimes they draw this picture and they say, okay, so we need to come up with concepts and relationships between those concepts. We have individuals and properties of those individuals. And then we have some uh, inference systems and uh, interfaces. So inference systems allow us to derive new information from all one and interfaces, well, they provide us interface to this technology because not everyone is so keen to see those definitions. People might want to prefer protege and other editors, other ontology manipulation uh, mechanisms. Okay, well, first I really want to cover everything in this picture. And then I thought, uh, well, we only have one day and you have people who are, well, better than me at explaining those things. So today we're going to look only in two boxes, this one and this one. So we're going to look at concepts and relationships between those concepts and what this means and everything related, and at inference systems uh, which can reason about concepts. Well, I completely and intentionally ignore uh, individuals and well a little bit of interfaces uh, but I'm not really a big specialist in that I don't speak to Python he knows that right okay again examples let's reiterate human B okay what is this I put now this symbol and if you ever had any logic you would recognize the symbol if not uh, well this strange thingy means not. Okay? So what does it mean? It means a concept of everything which is not human. Okay? So it's probably difficult to describe what it is, but it's easy to say that, okay, human, not human. Okay? Some other example, a living being and not human being. So what does it mean? It means someone who is alive, but not human. Fish, bird, giraffe, whatever. Easy. Okay, uh, let's just read this without trying to, you know, relate this to semantics yet. Okay, so those of you who remember this another strange symbol from your high maths, remember that this means for all. So what do I want to say? A human being and, okay, well I read the distance and, so a human being and for all has child may. So what does it mean? It means that for all objects in the has child relationships, they are made. So if this is a human being who only has sons. Okay? Male children. Well, interestingly, and that's one strange implication of the uh, model theoretic semantics, it can also mean someone who doesn't have any children. But that's because all my giraffes are green. This is a true sentence, because I don't have any. Okay? All my daughters are 50 years old. I don't have any.
Okay, so then again, another quantifier you've seen in your IMOPS existential. So it exists interested in computer science. What does it mean? So it's someone who has a success, who has an object in the computer science side, computer science uh, concept, and well, related with this interest in. So I have interest in computer science. Has interest in computer science. And not nothing. Exists interest in philosophy. So it's someone who is interested in computer science and not interested in philosophy. Okay? So I'm just generally introducing the description logic syntax without giving you formal definitions for it. Okay, another one is a student who is not interested in mathematics. Well, most of them are not interested in mathematics. <laughs> a student who only drinks tea. So everything for all drinks, for all that is in the drinks relation, it's tea. <laughs> Okay, and finally, this is a combination of for all that exists, and this is an interesting one. So forget about this symbol, this means something, thing. So what does it say? A person who has a child, so it exists something, some object, and this has child relation, and all children are made. So what does it mean? It means that someone who has a son, but the difference between this and that, so here, a ch person without children would classify, would, would satisfy this relation, this description, sorry. Whereas here, a person without children would not satisfy the description. So if you forget this bit, then a person with a daughter would also satisfy this description. So if you forget this middle bit, because it's a person, who has a child, and well, forget about this tea. But this thing says, but all children are made. So you have a child, and all your children are made. It means you have a male child. Okay. okay, now I come to the bit where those who know the first of the logic will say that, oh, it's boring. And those who don't might also say it's boring because I don't understand the thing. So I'll try my best to explain, okay? Uh, if I'm too slow, say, tell me, Boris Vaughan, if you don't understand something, please raise your hand and say, I don't get it. Okay? Right. So the semantics of description logic is a model theoretic or the semantics that task gave to those two logic. And when we talk about uh, explaining what concepts mean, we typically say that we need an interpretation and the interpretation has a domain. So what is a domain? It's a set. A set of objects, any objects. And now it really can get bizarre because I can say, okay, let this be my domain. Okay? It's an object. Set of objects, three pens. Or I can say that all people here would be my domain. Or all furniture here would be my domain. Now, when I talk about the interpretation of a concept, I say that concepts are interpreted as subsets of the domain. So a set is a collection of elements. A subset is a collection of elements that is smaller than everything. So, here I have three objects. It's a set. I can take two of them and say, well, it's a clearly subset of those three. Okay? One of them is also a subset. So a collection of elements, I'm just describing like this. I have them here, three elements. Right? Two of them are in one subset, another one is a different one. Like this. Now I decide that I'm going to interpret my concept human as these two, and I'm going to interpret my concept cut as this one. Right? So these two pens represent humans, and this one pen represents a cat. Okay? 
And now then rows are represented as relations between elements in the subset. So what does it mean a relation? It means that I can say, okay, well, let this n and this n be in has had relation. Means that the green human has the blue cut. Okay? So, again, every time we're talking about interpretations, we have a domain in mind, we associate subsets of the domain with concepts, we associate relationships which can actually be represented as arrows. Okay? Because rows are binary relations between pairs of elements. So for example, here I have one human who has four cuts. And then individuals are represented by the main elements. So these are individuals within the class of humans. And this is an, an individual in the class of cats. Okay. So let's have a look again at this example. How can I look at those concepts and interpret them with this three pen set? A human being. Well, I say this one is a human being. This sounds bizarre. But, you know, think about children. When they play, they say, okay, well, I have three uh, dolls. One is mother, one is daughter, and one is father. So for children, it's no difficulty at all to associate concepts with objects which are not necessarily who they really are. So why should the father pass? Okay, so I can say three elements. This is a human being. This is a living being. And this is male. Right. So I now have a human which is not living and not male. Well, that doesn't happen in real life, but according to my definition, this is possible. Okay, so why is the semantics of description and first order logic so peculiar? Well, I give you one explanation, possible explanation, because there is no hidden knowledge in this way of interpreting sentences. And again, you know, how many of you saw this sometimes in your life? Anyone? Yeah. For all the absolute, there exists delta such that the etc. Okay. Well, that's not bad, isn't it? Because that we understand. But then, guys, there is a lot of hidden knowledge associated with this formula. Like, for example, the notion of numbers. Okay? When you read it, you immediately say, oh, right. So, epsilon is a number, and delta is a number, and these numbers are both greater than zero. And this is the absolute value, and this is the minus, and now actually f is a function. Okay? So of course, it's so much easier in your year one in university when you already have these concepts in your mind because they are imprinted by our school education. Okay? So here, it's better, but we come with a baggage of knowledge. Now, if I want to specify knowledge about continuous functions, then of course I can rely on the mathematical formula. And I can you know, describe what is going on, and you have a computer algebra system or some other numeric manipulation system. But now you want to really exchange information about species of fish. Will this help you? That you come up with the knowledge of numbers? And can you really say for all, oh wait a minute, for all means every number. So I want to talk about fish, and all I can say is something about numbers. So the semantics of first order and description logic completely negates all previous knowledge about everything else at all. And therefore you really come with this bizarre idea of having a domain which is an arbitrary set, it can be a set of people, it can be a set of furniture, it can be a set of molecules, anything. 
And then you say, right, now I say, call this ones a father, call this ones a daughter, and let's have a relation between fathers and daughters. So, this is really important. Then the semantics, which I just introduced, this past the semantics, it offers no help in linking formally with what happens in the real world. So, but that's again something which you should really understand. Because when you say, has child, you immediately say, oh, I know what it means. It means someone who has a child. You give it to a machine, and for the machine, it's nothing. The machine has no knowledge of human relations, about children, about anything else at all. So, our formulae, our description logic expressions, have nothing to do with what things really mean in the world. Okay? That's something we just write, and we pass them from one machine to another machine. And it's up to the machine to interpret this. So, I'm going to give you this example that I interpret that this is human, this is male, and this is living. Right? So, of course, our real intention is to say that every human is a living being. But we have to say it explicitly, unless we say that actually it's one and the same element, that you can't be human but not alive, if you don't believe in vampires, uh, then it has to be an explicit knowledge. But that's exactly what we want. We want to explicitly characterize our um, What's this explicit specialization of whatever? We have to we have to give knowledge in an explicit way. So when we talk about uh, modeling, in principle, one in the same way as now we can say that every human being is a living being, we can say, okay, well, let's interpret our things. So we have a domain, and let's agree that, well, this is a set of human beings, and this is a set of clinical observations. Now notice that there is something which is both a human and a clinical observation, which doesn't happen to you all. So unless you explicitly say that this is to be excluded, the semantics of description logic allows for that. But actually, think twice whether you really want to exclude things, because if you start excluding too much, then uh, reasons to struggle. Okay, so what's the point then? Why? Why are you talking about these crazy languages? Why do we need this semantics? And then, then again, okay, well this is not about the semantics of description logic, it's about the uh, model theoretic semantics idea. But what it says is the following. The chief utility of a formal semantic theory is not to provide any deep analysis of the nature of the things being described by the language, but to provide a technical way to determine when inference process is made. Okay? And then it becomes really interesting. So why do you want it? Because it allows us to come up with procedures which behave in the way we can describe. Okay? But you've got to remember that when you say as child, it doesn't mean that the machine immediately understands. Okay? Unless you sort of describe what it means. So what can we express in the emotions? And then I thought, okay, well, a good example is you open a dictionary and you look up a definition. So I found a definition of table from the uh, New American Dictionary. So a table is a piece of furniture that has a flat top and one or more legs providing a level surface on which objects may be placed and that can be used for such purposes as eating, writing, working, or playing games. Okay, so you read this definition and then any object which fits this is a table. And any object which doesn't fit this definition is not a table. So essentially, a dictionary tries to do exactly the same thing as what we are trying to do in description logic. It tries to introduce new terms based on things we already understand. But then again, it also has some bizarre consequences. So for example, I have here two pictures, and I think then 
This is a table, and this is not. Because this has no less. It's hanging on the chains. In the intended meaning of the definition, I'm not so sure. But still, we are right. Because typically, if something fits this definition, well, we understand what it means. So essentially, when we talk about description logic, when we talk about ontologies, the point is to define relationships between terms, but if you leave something out, it's undefined. Okay? Right. Okay, then there you can probably look how uh, the our language is uh, interpreted in description logic semantics. Okay, so if you are familiar with protege, you know that there are things such as thing and nothing. And in description logic, these are typically denoted like top and bottom. This comes from the uh, largest theory. Forget about it, just convention. So what is thing? Thing is everything. Absolutely all elements in my domain. So whatever the domain is, three fans, thing is all three of them. Nothing? Well, nothing. No elements. It's not element of most nothing. So then it's already said, concepts are interpreted as subsets of the domain. And then we have this symbol, which in OWL and in Protege is known as the section of. And in description logic, we don't use this symbol. It comes from math. So those who uh, know mathematics, there is this symbol used for union. But uh, because they want to make a distinction, which is the formal level of post descriptions and semantics, they say that this is what we do in the domain, but when we want to join concepts, we use the same symbol but drawn slightly different. So it's just a square version of the union sign. Oh, sorry, intersection sign. Now the union is, well, the picture is rubbish, so let's have a look. You interpret A as this subset, we interpret B as this subset. So what is A intersect B? Well, it's the set of elements which belong both to A and B. And here they are. Okay, so this belongs to B. And in the same way it belongs to A. Therefore, it belongs to both A and B in the section of the set. What is the union? The union is both sets change. The complement of is everything else, right? And this is really important because I already was drawing your attention. Can you in real life describe what is not human? Well, you just see whether it's human, and if not, then it's not, right? But you can't probably sort of go through them one by one. But here, you have to have a notion of your interpretation domain, and then it's easy. So everything outside A and B, Like this is the complement of the union of A and B. So this is, let me write it here, not a sorry, uh, union. Okay, now it gets a little bit more complicated because we introduce uh, bigger risk, uh, we introduce restrictions, right? So, okay, I hope you found it a little bit natural to read expressions like for all that exists, even in this uh, concept with uh, writing. But essentially, when it comes to interpretations, it's not that difficult. So, how do we interpret all being a strong or only as a strong and protege? So, what it means? This is your interpretation domain. And here you have some C. So some objects. So well, how do I interpret now exists R dot C? So it has to be a point somewhere in my domain. 
such that if you draw the R arrow, you end up in C. Okay, there might be more than one point having this property. So if you check all of them, then this is your interpretation of exist R dot C. Right. But what it also means, look at this element. It might have another R successor, which is outside C. Well, that's fine. I don't mind. As long as every element in here has a, an element in C connected by the R relation, it's all right. It looks suspicious, no? No, no, no. I'm okay. Okay. I just, I just noticed the drawing is disjoint from C. Well, it can be, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's easy to understand this way. <laughs> right, so then what for audience? It means the following. You have this C here, and now you look at elements such that if you look at all their hard successes, then all of them have to be in C. So then, this is the interpretation of for all R. And again, notice that I here have two elements who don't have any R successes, but that's what I already told you. So the sentence that all my daughters are 50 years old, okay, I don't have any element in the daughter relation, has daughter relation. Therefore, if it's not, if it doesn't have any uh, R successes, then it's okay. But if it has R successes, then all of them have to belong to C. So then, this is our interpretation of uh, all this. And that's what I tried. So, you know, that is what the picture is supposed to represent. Okay, but then sometimes you really want to count. Sometimes you want to say things such as a person who has at least three children. Right? So, what was that heroic mother? I think, I don't know, but it exists nowadays. Probably not. But in the Soviet Union, women with three or more children had a special, special status. How do you describe that? Well, easy. So let's try and represent the concept of How can I describe the cost of money here? Well, it's just something like female Yeah, so a female that who has at least three children and we don't care who these children are yeah. But should it be the statement that uh, exists in children? Uh, the semantics of uh, exists of, of uh, this is existential. It means exists at least three. Right? So if you have no children, then you don't satisfy this requirement. If it's the other way around, not more than, then it means that you might have no children or one or two, but never more than. So we can also, well, this is not really politically correct, but let me do it this way. So a happy father is someone who is male and has less than three children. <laughs> Okay, so the semantics of that is, well, pretty much it's very close to this one, right? So here we just require existence of at least one. Here, we require existence of at least three. Here we say that all successors have to be in the C relationships. In the, in, sorry, in the C concept. Here we require that no more than three are in this relationship. 
Right. And then sometimes we can build up on that. And I'm not going to talk about a relationship between concepts now, but rather uh, talk a little bit about the relationship between properties we can impose. So sometimes we want to have um, a sub-property property, property uh, or equivalence property. So examples of that would be so you can say that things like if you have a daughter, then you have a child. Yeah? So everyone who has a daughter has a child. Uh, sometimes you can say that certain names are equivalent, and all of this is progressive. So that's what they do there. Uh, we can sort of uh, also introduce a super property, which is the other way of, of, of expressing this one. Uh, we can have inverse properties. So, for example, if you have a has child daughter relation, then the inverse of it would be for daughters uh, with their parents. Sometimes you can have a transitive growth. So, what does it mean? A typical example of a transitive relation is is part. So, what is the thing that part of? Well, the thing is a part of hand. What is a hand part of? A hand is a part of arm. What is a arm part of? It's a part of the body, right? But that really mean that the finger is not a part of my body. Oh no. Do you really want to stack all this information that the finger is a part of hand, arm, and body? No. What you really want, you want this hand is part relationship to be transitive. What does it mean? It means that if a finger is a part of hand and the hand is a part of arm, then the finger is also a part of arm. And this is done by having transitive rows in our hand and And then we have sometimes functional rows, which essentially mean that um, So remember our R relation, and I drew it like uh, this for some objects. But this is not a function. A function that all, always maps things one to one. So you take one element and map it into another element. So this is uh, not allowed if you say that your relation R is function. And sometimes you have your inverse functional relation, which essentially means that uh, The other direction you can't have um, more than two more than two hours, half hours, can be the same. Right, so then you also can have symmetric and you can have the main range of relations. And I want to conclude it just to give you some key to understand how sometimes you see uh, kind of various names being flushed at you. So EL, ALC, uh, S, Schick, Roy, Schoen, and people, you know, introduce most of them. And, you know, sometimes people get really frustrated with all those names. So this really only depends on what constructs you use when you uh, come up with your constant description. So it's all started pretty much with trying to give some formal semantics to our drawings. And people are looking at it and they're being cautious not to introduce too much because they knew that, say, first of the logic is undecidable, they really wanted some sort of limited fragment. So, one idea was something known as AL, and it stands for alphabet language. And then you could sort of construct your concept descriptions by taking concept names like human, time, space. You could have a negation, but only in front of uh, the concept name would say itself. So you could say things like not human, but you couldn't say not has child or daughter. Okay? Then you could have uh, an intersection, you could have 
the existence of the universal restriction, or many restriction, um, which was modified so you could get things like all children are daughters. But when it was coming to the existential restriction, they were just saying that you can state the existence of an object, but you can't say what this object is. So this talk means you have someone in this relationship, but no specification of what it is. So for example, in this language you can say things like exist has child and the set for all children female. Means someone who has a child and all the children are female, daughters. But you can't say as child male and as child female. So this is not available in the and then there was some fl minus and fl minus zero, sorry, fl zero, um, which are fragments of al. I think the slides would be available somewhere. I don't know. You can sort of, if you have ever lost, you can look it up. And then this language, which uh, I'm going to talk about next, in the next session, article language with complements. Essentially, the difference is that you can apply negation directly in front of any concept description, not just concept name. Okay, then in principle I would leave the same uh, description as uh, in uh, AL, but in fact this becomes expressible. So now we can have expression saying that someone who has a child male and has a child female. Okay, so we can specify uh, various things. And obviously, this is because of the negation which you put into the language. And then uh, it gets really sort of. Uh, so, this is your ALC. Sorry. But then, some letters come from uh, what you require from a uh, uh, relation. So, if you can say that certain relation is functional, meaning that it has to go from one to some specific object, then you can't sort of split. And then it gives you a letter F in the name of the logic. So for example, what is ALCF? It means ALC with functional rows. It doesn't mean that every row is functional. Okay? It only means that you can say that certain row is functional. So for example, as child is not a functional row. Why? Why is as child not a functional row? Because you can't have more than one child. Okay? For example, has father, is it functional or not? Well, if you believe in biology, then yes. Okay, because everyone has just one father. Okay, so if you want to describe that in your ALCF, then you can have all the examples of concepts, uh, concept descriptions I presented, and you say that has father is a functional row, functional row, sorry, whereas has child is not. So remember, if you have functionality, it doesn't mean that everything is functional, but some of them can be. And stands for unmodified number restrictions. So this is when you can say that you have at most, say, three children, or it is four children, but you cannot specify who these children are. So you can't say uh, at least three daughters and at most five sons in the same expression which is possible in uh, qualified number restrictions. So this is when you say, I have these three daughters and most five sons. So all this has, obviously, given name to a So what is ALCQ? It's ALC with quantified number restrictions. Notice that if you have that, then you already can express your unqualified number restrictions because instead of C, it would think and you can actually have the functionality uh, but we uh, see how this is done and then because having too many letters was annoying people have decided to uh, abbreviate ALC plus sensitivity as S so S stands for ALC with sensitivity so what is SQ? it's ALC Plus transitivity, plus qualified number restrictions. Transitivity, we've seen an example with this 
path. So, for example, you know, this is really, really uh, expressive logic. We can talk about many things. But people don't stop there. Sometimes they introduce inverse terms. So, for example, you can have uh, a relation has child, and the inverse of that is has parent. So if someone is my child, I'm their parent. Therefore, these two relationships link things in the opposite direction. So then gives you letter I. So what is L, what is S I Q? It's ALC, last trinity rules, last qualified number restrictions, last inverse terms. I'm finishing it. Then you can have the relationships such as has daughter is a subrelation of uh, has child, which is uh, known as rule of hierarchy, and that gives you letter H. And typically they put H after S. So that becomes Ch in English. So what is logic SH? SH is ALC plus positivity plus rule of hierarchy. Okay? So it's just composition. What is SHI? SHI. She. It's uh, ALC plus positivity plus rule of hierarchy plus the inverse row. What is she? ALC plus sensitivity plus roll hierarchies hierarchy, plus the inverse roll plus qualified number restrictions. And lots of papers were written on SHIC because it's really, really expressive log logic in which you can describe a lot of various uh, concept descriptions and uh, almost everything fits in. But then people said, okay, well, sometimes you want more. Uh, complex relationships between rows, not just transitivity, but you change the composition of two and it gives you a third one. Uh, to try to come up with a good example now. If you want, I, I can think about one. But this gives you letter R, and then instead of shape, and remember, if you have R, then you automatically have H, so you can have instead of shape, you have three. Okay, so 3 stands for ALC plus positivity plus uh, complex role inclusions plus the inverse role plus the modified number restrictions. And that finishes my picture, except that I, again, quite uh, intention, uh, intentionally, I made it letter O, which stands for nominals, and I hope someone in this school will cover this later on. So uh, the now the standard our two DL, which is essentially our two with the description of semantics, essentially is Sroik. So you know nominals are typically put this way. So Sroik is pretty much our two. And you know, the only purpose of doing this exposition was not to give precise notion of what these things are, because I think you know these are details. Okay, if you really need them, once you understand well what ALC is and how it works, adding those bits is is okay. Okay? But really, when you look at papers or descriptions, or in Protege, I think there is a tab where you can find uh, information about the uh, expressive power of your ontology, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, let's just say it's she or sh or she or stroy. Well, that's what it means. It means which expressions I allow in the constructions. But in reality, when they analyze the uh, ontology, what they do is they just see which ones were used, and then they report as a batch. Okay, so what coming next? We're going to look at ELC. And releasing the problems, and then EL, and then finally, uh, I don't know how we split it into the hours, but we're going to have uh, those logic based ontology and engineering, and then the uh, last session. Thanks. <laughs>